the very rules of eating, of negativity and singularity, including the ultimate form of singularity, which is This is the typical violence of information. It's violent because what happens there is a murder of the wheel, the vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. Welcome to this week's edition of the Machinic Unconscious Happy Hour with Cooper Cherry and Taylor Atkins, as always, sponsored by the People's Institute for Revolutionary Semiotics. Before we introduce our guest and topic, we just want to mention we've got a Patreon account, patreon.com forward slash M-U-H-H. Consider dropping us a dollar a month there, or if not, leave us a nice review on iTunes. Today's guest is Gil Morejon, co-host of the What's Left of Philosophy podcast, translator of French philosophy, actually recently translated Spinoza's Paradoxical Conservatism by Francois Zurabicelli. How do you... Zurabicelli. Yeah. Zurabicelli. That was a tough one. That was a tough one. But it's also author of The Unconscious of Thought in Leibniz, Spinoza, and Hume from Edinburgh Press. So welcome back to uh, the happy hour, Gil. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Really excited to be with you guys. Glad to have you here to help hold my hand, or both of you kind of hold my <laughs> hand, kind of like the meme with Splinter and the Ninja Turtles where he's in the middle. That's kind of like, I'm Splinter today, and so you guys can hopefully philosophy 101 pill me. So you're Splinter like in the at the other side of the meme when he has to be held up by yeah, the, kind of by like the, that, by the turtles? Yeah. Uh, gotcha. But so I forgot to mention, so we're looking at Kant's prolegomena to any future metaphysics today, and so... Luckily, Gil is, was uh, kind enough to hop on with us and, like I said, hold my hand through this thing. So maybe you want to get your origin story, Gil. I don't think we did that last time oh, we sure. did on the show. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, you know, like if you have an anecdote, maybe thinker, you know, just something kind of a singularity for you that stands out into as far as, you know, what got you into philosophy in general. Sure. And then if well, you want to go specific, please feel free. Yeah, it's. I mean, I was really happy to come on with you guys last time to talk anti Oedipus. Uh, I did my undergrad at Villanova and sort of fell down a Deleuze hole. Worked there with uh, John Carvalho and like took a class on philosophy of music, and we read the refrain from uh, a Thousand Plateaus. Got really excited about that stuff and wanted to write a thesis on it. And he said, "Well, if you want to write a thesis on Deleuze on the Deleuze and Guattari stuff, you should do anti Oedipus because it's actually a book that has a." thesis and an argument <laughs> right. whereas it does about those much more all over the place so i was really into anti-oedipus and that really framed a lot of my thinking when i ended up going to grad school i found trying to make sense of deleuze i, I like kept going back to his sources the sources for his thinking right and that led me to actually you know not abandon deleuze obviously but instead focus my sort of scholarly attention on the early moderns in particular that work led to the book that I just published on Leibniz, Spinoza, and Hume. And interestingly, a lot of this has to do with thinking about what philosophy has to look like after Kant. And we were talking a little bit before we hit the record button recently, I've been looking at Maimon, Solomon Maimon, another one of Deleuze's influences, who writes in 1790, the essay on transcendental philosophy has this like encounter with Kant's first critique and completely changes his thinking, but thinks that in order to sort of complete Kant's project or to go beyond the limits of Kant's project, he has to go back, this is his language, and construct a coalition system of thinkers. And that includes Leibniz, Spinoza, and Hume for him. So lots of interesting stuff going on. Hopefully we can touch on some of these ideas in, in today's conversation. Looking forward to this. I'm glad you brought up the coalition system because that was something that, that Dan kind of harped on. So we got some overlap. We got some nice serendipity going on here. And, you know, one of the things that I do think, you know, as we know, the critique of pure reason, just to kind of set the stage and talk generally, one of the phrases, by the way, that Kant, I think, uses a lot that's almost a tell is this in general, this mm -hmm. phrase. It's not like Algemeine, is it? It's, uh, I think it's Uberhaupt, I think. Uber Uberhaupt, okay. We can get to that later, but I guess the critique of pure reason, right, as we all know, is at least 800 pages. <laughs> it's a little long. It's a little long. <laughs> Some parts are more interesting than others. I do think 
for the most part, Khan is clear. Now, maybe in the Pearl of Galvana, he he's a little bit repetitive because he's trying to nail down. He's trying to hit us over the head with these basic ideas that may that he seems his readers in the first reviews out on the critique kind of missed, perhaps. But instead of doing 800 pages, which you know, with Coop and I, it's it's kind of hard to to do a book of that size and do any sort of justice to it. So it felt like the prolegomena would be a nice like first step, right? Mm -hmm. And to get some of the outlines of what's going on. Yeah, I thought this would really help with uh, just, yeah, kind of some grounding in Deleuze and just giving you, giving me some kind of, you know, more rich understanding of his work and how it touches upon Kant. But also, you know, Kant is kind of like the, the philosopher of modernity would i mean would we even say modernity or yeah totally because it's weird because i guess descartes is kind of descartes is also considered maybe like this touchstone for modern philosophy it's kind of weird right because there's such a sort of gap in between there uh, I, I i would let you answer this maybe it's, does the early modern period i mean because yeah you could say modern philosophy is inaugurated with kant or or descartes i've always heard that right. and i suppose the early modern is supposed to kind of again be like what i'd mentioned to you in, in the english literature it's like the long 18th century yeah, yeah. <laughs> is it allows you to like hold on to some of the origins of the novel move from this kind of renaissance you know stuff you can almost like touch your your toes into like a little bit of like the aftermath of shakespeare all the way up to the early 19th century they get to have a little bit of everything so i wonder about the early modern and i guess my way of framing this would be is it basically the descartes or let's say kant insofar as they start to move beyond or reformulate what we might think of as like medieval scholasticism is this basically what the modern means in uh for philosophy at least it's hard to know exactly how to like do this periodization work without like oversimplifying things but i do think that early modernity one way or another does start sometime in the early 1600s and it is characterized among other things as like a break with mostly aristotelian ways of thinking that were dominant all the way up through the middle ages and like the renaissance and so with people like descartes but also in other ways francis bacon you could also point to hobbes right early Uh 1600s you got all these people who are like you know especially with physics the whole aristotelian way of thinking about physics is like a science of nature where individual things have substantial forms and those forms endow them with like powers that allow them to act in certain ways. And all of that goes out the window in the early 1600s, right? You got instead thinking about nature as like a system of laws where things don't have essences in the same kind of way anymore. We're kind of throwing out that whole sort of Aristotelian essence framework in favor of a new kind of attempt at scientific thinking. And a lot goes along with that. Kant changes the game considerably. So you get, you know, the development of these ideas throughout the 16 and 1700s, you know, people often, Kant is in some ways responsible for this, describe what's going on there as like a development of two distinct trends. And again, this is sort of oversimplified, but you get this sort of rationalist tradition Mm -hmm. coming out of Descartes with thinkers like Spinoza, like Leibniz, who think that, you know, we can have rational access to nature or understanding of nature in itself as a kind of intuitable or rationally accessible thing we get great system builders right you know you can read leibniz's monadology and it's like Mm -hmm. in in 12 pages you have the entirety of his metaphysics it's wild Mm -hmm. but then on the other hand you get this like strong empiricist strain of mostly mostly british and scottish thinkers with Locke, uh with barclay with hume who are developing a kind of skeptical critique of this idea of dogmatic metaphysics right they're saying in fact, you don't have just through your reason alone or your intellect alone access to the nature of things. You know, as good empiricists, we think that knowledge is based instead on experience, but there's hard limits to what that can give you. If I'm human, right, I can say, I guess the sun will rise tomorrow, but I don't have any knowledge of that, right? right. I don't have, don't have future experience, obviously, so I have no knowledge of the future. I have this skeptical relationship where, you know, do I know, in fact, that the one billiard ball caused the other to move? And for Hume, the answer is no. That's just like a kind of guess at best based on the stuff that I've seen in the past, right? The stuff that I've kind of inductively inferred. And there's hard limits to whether that can count as knowledge or not, right? With Kant, he's like trying to synthesize these two strains 
and to do so in a way that satisfies both of these instincts, right? He wants to say that, in fact, the skeptical critique is onto something. We don't have rational access to things in themselves. That's true. On the other hand, there is still a place for this metaphysical kind of cognition. And he thinks he can kind of rescue it by sort of flipping the script. The basic gesture of Kant's critical turn or the Copernican revolution is to say, hey, you know, instead of thinking that my understanding conforms to the nature of things as they are. What if there's something about the structure of cognition that imposes form on the thing yep. that I'm understanding, right? And if that's the case, then I can analyze the structure of cognition and that will tell me what I can know about things, not as they are in themselves, but as they appear to me due to the structure of cognition, it's going to have certain sorts of rules or principles, and that'll allow us to resolve some of these longstanding sorts of controversies, right? So like you said before, like some of the more exciting stuff in the first critique is like the anti enemies where it's like, it seems like I can both argue convincingly for why the, the universe is infinite and why it has to be finite, right? This mm -hmm. sort of irresolvable dialectical contradiction. And he's like, yeah, that's because you're mistaking the way that things appear for you for the way that they are so-called in themselves. And once you make that step and you go beyond, as he'll put it, the boundaries of possible experience, of course, you're going to land in contradiction. So his whole thing is trying to figure out like, you know, what the structure of cognition is. It's a sort of complicated picture. You have like forms of sensibility or intuition, space and time, and the understanding synthesizes intuitions by means of the categories and judgments. And then we have this sort of drive to go beyond experience and to make claims beyond what's actually possible for us to know. And now we're going to speculate about the soul, the world, and God. Right. So he's trying to develop like a scientific account of cognition. And I think that one way of understanding, just to go all the way back to your sort of initial question here, like if there's something kind of characteristic of the sort of philosophical modernity that we get with Kant, it's that perspective shift, right? Instead of going out and trying to do metaphysics first, instead, we're going to go think about the subject, think about the subject's cognition or structures of cognition first, and that will allow us to make claims about you know what there is or something like this, right? So there's a kind of priority to the epistemological that I think we get with philosophical modernity. Maybe starting with Descartes, right? This is the cogito, but Kant really kind of pushes it to the next level. In the scientific realm, just the way that you kind of helpfully think about the shift in philosophy, it feels like it was, it's kind of reacting to the shift in science, Copernicus, Galileo, the shift towards a, a heliocentric model, which gets rid of the Ptolemaic model, which yep. itself was Aristotelian, right? Yep. And ever complicating it's more and, and, and Kant even kind of in the prolegomena he makes an aside to this retrograde movement of the planets yeah. is not is not actually a part of our it's not our senses fault that we seem right. to s see this uh retrograde movement and so by adding the epicycles to try to justify them through the understanding we're actually it's actually we're giving into the illusions that the understanding brings us right i, I actually kind of appreciated that where Kant made a kind of a good point and it, and it seemed to give more weight to this Copernican revolution metaphor that he wants to run. It's not our senses fault. We just haven't yet kind of, as you said, done the, the critique and, and, and bounded. We haven't sort of thought through the operatory structures and constitution of sensibility and understanding, blah, 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 which we'll get into. The second thing I would say uh, really quickly was the fact that, um, you know, this, well, I, I guess I had a few things to say, but I'll just, I'll just keep it to two where it, it does seem like this notion that we can look within, um, you know, it, it feels, it feels kind of, I know that the, what the, the translation we use or I use was the Cambridge version, uh, which was, what's his name? Paul, is it Gadding? Is that the translator? uh gary hartfield i don't know uh, yeah yeah okay so so hartfield had this kind of note sort of in the middle of the prolegomena that 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 kant may not have had much uh interaction with with descartes writings maybe he kind of knew of them broadly speaking but it does feel like this searching within ourselves seems to all seems to also start with Descartes. So there's something yeah. similar. Yeah, Ob obviously Kant introduces time into the cogito or whatever as Deleuze will say. But I do think it's interesting that Kant kind of takes up in passing again, this notion of sort of where 
we either go out into the world and, and experience or sort of, sort of empirically, but then we can never really justify beforehand, as he says, purely and universally in a valid way, all of these things, or we have to kind of go inside, as you, as you said. And he mentioned some, some German who's able to like cut the baby in half and try to have it both ways. And so it's like, God puts these things in us. <laughs> and it seems like Kant doesn't want to follow that path or this Cartesian path where it's about either, you know, the evil genius, the deus deceptor, <laughs> or this perfectly good and truthful God. Kant kind of wants to avoid that move while still maybe following in, in some of the, the manner that Descartes had done, which is like, you know, when I, I got to start with doubt. I got to start in here in the cogito yeah. with doubt before I can look out in the world. One way of getting into what Kant's up to here is Hume has this critique of causal knowledge, right? Or of, of the idea of cause and effect causation. And this is both in the treatise of human nature and in the inquiry concerning human understanding. And basically it works like this. He's like, look, when I talk about X causing Y, what I'm saying is when X is given, Y follows necessarily, right? There's right. a necessity to the connection there. And the problem is when it comes to matters of fact, right? Empirical stuff that I actually like go out and I witness and experience, I don't ever get that necessity, right? And the way I know that that's true True is because I can always imagine that the contrary would be possible, right? There's no contradiction in thinking that, you know, when one billiard ball hits another, that nothing happens or worse, that the billiard ball becomes a dove and flies away. That's weird, maybe, but there's no contradiction in thinking that. So his conclusion here is to say, well, it turns out then that I'm not justified rationally in talking about causes or causal relations. And I might not even have a coherent concept of causation at all insofar as it involves this kind of necessity, and necessity doesn't ever seem to get delivered to me in experience. So Kant thinks that's right on the level of when I look in experience, I don't actually see the necessity of the causal relation, but I do have this idea. I do have this idea of necessity and of causation, and it structures my experience. So he thinks that again, Hume's mistake was thinking that my knowledge or my idea of causation comes from experience. And then when you go looking for it, of course, you're not going to find it there. He goes, it's just the other way around. Causation is one of the categories that my understanding has. It's yeah. one of the categories that structures experience and makes it possible. The directionality goes the other way. So this is his like basic move. He thinks that, you know, Hume saw this with regard to causation. Kant goes, oh no, actually it's a much deeper problem than that. Anytime that there's an idea that involves necessity, universality, anything about always or will be the case. And these are all of the categories. He goes, none of those can come from experience. All of them are involved in structuring experience. This is where he gets the 12 categories out of the table of judgments, which is sort of this like a weird moment in both the critique and in the prolegomena where he's like, well, handily, we've got these 12 kinds of judgment. Each mm -hmm. of those turns out to have a category, but they're all different ways of giving necessity to a kind of diversity or to, as he puts it, a manifold, right? The other thing I wanted to say in response to what you were talking about, Taylor, is the other sort of scientific revolution that's happening around this time in which like a lot of philosophy is trying to play catch up with and kind of make itself adequate to is Newton and Newtonian physics. Right, right, right. Which again, totally different from that previous like Aristotelian way of thinking about physics. We have the sort of three laws and it's like, it seems apodictically certain. It's got a kind of necessity to it that seems undeniable. It's explanatorily powerful. How is it possible, right? This is Kant's question. How is this science of nature possible? And his answer is, well, it's not because the things in themselves have a kind of lawfulness to them. It's because that's how we cognize nature. There's a the sort of way that we make sense of things as they appear to us has a lawful necessity, it's structured in accordance with the categories. And now we can kind of do a science of nature that doesn't need to say, you know, I was just doing a reading group with some folks and we read Barclay and I had never read Barclay before. And mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever looked at Barclay, but no. it's wild how hard it is to disagree with Barclay, even as he's saying the most outlandish shit you have ever heard about how like bodies don't exist and nothing exists outside of perception. But his basic move is to be like, look, every time you say not as I see it, not as I perceive it, not as I think it, but as it really is, you're contradicting yourself because you're right. still thinking it in that moment. And Hume's sort of like, yeah, but like that doesn't mean there's no bodies, you weirdo. But we can still do natural science. It's just that we don't need to make the further claim of saying that in fact, things in themselves operate this way. It's good enough if we say, no, this is how they have to appear to me because of the structuring kind of cognition that I have. There's a lot going on there. I don't know if I'm moving too quickly. No, no, you're no, not. I, I would like to ask just a very uh, 
fundamental question would be like, how are the categories derived? Is this something that's inherited through Aristotelian philosophy or just the history of philosophy in general? Or where, where do those originate, I suppose? Yeah, this is kind of a weird moment in the critique where he's just, like I said, he's literally like, kind of helpfully, we've got this table of judgments. Here are the 12 kinds of judgment. And oh, look, all the 12 categories come out of this. It is sort of something he kind of inherits. It, it does go all the way back to like Aristotle and like the prior and the posterior analytics. And like, this is one of the questions that Kant's successors are going to ask about, right? Like, this is a big deal for Hegel, who's like, Where'd those judgments come from, man? That seems like a weird thing to just like adopt uncritically for you, Mr. Critical Philosopher. Right, Where'd right. that come from? And Kant sort of, this is one of the moments I think where Kant punts. There's a few moments in the critique where, and in the prolegomena where he's just like, look, I don't have answers to these questions, right? He says, for instance, like as finite knowers, as finite cognizers, like you and I and whatever human beings, I guess, in general, we have these forms of intuition, space and time, and that feeds us sort of sense data that our understanding cognizes in accordance with the 12 categories. And he's like, and I can explain to you how all of that works. But if you ask me why just these 12 categories, if you ask me why space and time. I don't know. That just seems to be the case. That's just a fact of cognition. And, you know, like I said, the subsequent German idealists, Fick to Schelling, Hegel are all going to be like, that's kind of not good enough, dude. Like we need a derivation of these things, not just a kind of pointing to it as a fact. That seems like a presupposition that at least calls into question the legitimacy of the system or like it's it's conclusive character, which Kant wants for it, right? He wants this to be scientific philosophically. It's interesting, just off the top of my head, I was thinking of, you know, because I was almost anticipating what Coop was going to ask about the 12, you know, there's something satisfying about 12, right? Because it's, you got the triad, right? Mm -hmm. You got the Trinity, and then four is supposed to sort of square the tr Trinity into this beautiful harmony, and you multiply it by, you multiply the that quadrature by three, right? So you get 12. And I just, I think about um one of the one of the examples he gives, which I don't think is a good one, but it's one that he always comes to is about how five plus seven is 12. Yeah. Right. It, you know, <laughs> and so like, where is this, this fixation on twelve? But yeah, anyway, that's, that's just oh, that's funny. I hadn't noticed that. That's true. You know, yeah. but that's his favorite thing. Five. There's nothing in, in five and seven that give us that necessarily is a priori 12, blah, blah, blah. Right. But, yeah. yeah. That's in the context of the discussion of, so he says, look, the thing called science that we're after here has this particular characteristic that it produces statements or propositions or judgments that are both a priori and synthetic. So to kind of like, you know, work out the terminology here a little bit, the distinction between analytic and synthetic judgments is that an analytic judgment, as he says, is like ampliative or clarifying. I just take something of a subject and I'm going to attach a predicate to it, but the predicate's already contained in the subject, in the it's concept tautological, of, It's basically. tautological, exactly. And so, you know, bachelor is an unmarried man. Like, that doesn't add anything to the concept. A synthetic judgment does, right? It says something about the subject that's not contained in its concept, so we're adding, we're getting new knowledge. So that's our first distinction. And like, I don't know, Taylor is, a, is an unmarried man, is a synthetic judgment, and it may or may not be true, I don't know. So what's the principle behind these kinds of judgments? Well, an analytic judgment's principle is non-contradiction because if I say the opposite, there's a contradiction there, right? Bachelor's not an unmarried man. We've got a con an immediate contradiction on our hands. That's not the principle behind synthetic judgments, which needs me to go beyond just non-contradictoriness. And they tend to be based on experience, generally speaking. So he says, this is what's interesting about pure mathematics. This is what's interesting about the natural sciences, a la Newton. And this is hopefully what will be cool about metaphysics, which we'll get to in a second, is that mm. these are synthetic judgments adding new knowledge, but where the that's not based on experience, right? That is a priori, that isn't kind of subject to the sorts of skeptical doubts that we get with Hume. The example for mathematics, 5 plus 7 equals 12 is a weird one. But his point is something like the concept 12 isn't contained in the ideas 5 plus 7. It's new. Right. It's a weird sort of example. People, I think, often find it unsatisfying. Uh -huh. But I think if we use like bigger, because it because you might be like, I don't know, 12 does seem like it's, it's contained in 5 plus 7, maybe. But if we use much bigger numbers, it's harder to see how the concept of, I don't know, however many tens of thousands plus however many millions is the sum actually contained in those like that's harder to like imagine is obviously true mm -hmm. or again like if you use geometric examples you know i can construct really complicated truths about the relationships between like line segments that bisect a circle and is that contained in the concept circle and he thinks the answer to that is no so then the question how is it possible for me to have these sorts of synthetic a priori judgments and he says because we're just working with 
the forms of space and time there. We're not going out and looking at experience. We're just like working out what is true about these forms of intuition. A priori, it doesn't require experience, right? I don't need to actually encounter a circle drawn in the world to know that this is true about circles. I already talked about this a little bit with the natural sciences, but he thinks something similar is going on there. We can analyze the categories, see what they are going to determine is true about the way appearance works. And that's just what the science of nature is. And then hopefully also we'll be able to do this with metaphysics as well. Talking not just about experience, but what exceeds possible experience. And here we get like the self, the world and God about which he says, look, there's actually pretty much no knowledge to be had if by knowledge we mean something actually indubitable, but we can see why we end up going there, right? He's always yeah. talking. I think it's fascinating that he's always talking about this sort of instinct or impulse that we seem to have to do metaphysics. He's like, yeah. look, no one can pretend they don't care about the question of the soul. No one can yep. pretend they just yep. don't give a shit about God. Can I have knowledge about it? No, turns out. But we do seem to want it. We do seem to need it. So this is what the sort of negative critical part of the of the project is, right? Drawing those those boundaries where we can talk about what is it that we can legitimately claim to know, and that's just appearances or how things appear to us, objects of appearance or of experience in general. And anything beyond that, self, world, God, the totality of causes, the whole of the universe. He's like, yeah, reason pushes us towards that necessarily. That's not because we're idiots. It's because we have this drive for completion in our knowledge. And we just don't get to have that. Right? Yeah. We just don't get to have that. I know that he goes into this more in the critique, but he seems to relate this drive to to the imagination, right? And he's he's kind of like, look, the imagination's always going to sort of dream of these yeah. of these bigger things, and we shan't we shouldn't fault it for that. In fact, he's like, it's better to have a little bit more enthusiasm. I think it's kind of the German word, the schwarmerei, right? Schwarmer, like, yeah. It's good for the imagination to be a little bit enthusiastic, if you will, but it's easier to allow understanding and reason to circumscribe that than if the imagination were lazy and dull and didn't. Yeah didn't sort of push us to try to, you know, reach these these higher unities in the in this way. One thing that was interesting in your exposition just there, Gil, was this notion that seems to come out pretty clearly when he's using the geometrical reasoning, right? And it seems to be that for him, space and time, if we think of them devoid of all objects, and space is the easier one to use for this synthetic a priori stuff. But it seems to be about how it's there's a pureness for him to the understanding or sensibility because now we aren't thinking a particular object. We're just thinking of the form in which objects yeah. can appear, right? Exactly. Is there something? This is what I was getting to about this. I don't want to call it a tick, but almost a rhetorical flourish about the in general because mm. it, it it does feel like that starts to become synonymous with the pure and universal that he's seeking, where it's about it's about space or time, but particularly space in general, mm. which is like devoid of any particular objects and therefore devoid of what would be given an experience. There's something about if we just stick to the to that form, then we can see sort of how, you know, our understanding works or how our understanding applies its laws or its forms to what we call nature. And I guess that would be a follow up. I do want to get to this at some point, but it does seem like what Kant is calling nature is very, I don't want to say counterintuitive because I don't yeah. mean it that way, but it's very different from what we might think of in what he would say, maybe the dogmatic sense or even in the empiricist sense, because nature is something I think totally different for Kant. And maybe we should talk a little bit about that, but I'll, I'll give you a chance to, to respond. Just yeah. Kind of that's right. The way he starts talking about nature is as the lawful way in which objects appear to us. Right. right. Which is like, you're not wrong, counterintuitive. We tend to think of nature as external to us and as actually being that thing out there. And he's like, we don't get to talk about that. you guys. Yep, we just yep. don't get to do that because we get wrapped up in all these same sorts of old kinds of contradictions, right? What do you mean? Not the way it appears to me, but as it really is, how are you, how do you know what that would look like? How would you have access to that? And his answer is you don't, but that's okay because there's still a lawfulness and a systematicity to the way that things appear to us. And that's what the work of natural science is doing, right? Is figuring out that law, that set of laws. To go back to the other thing you said about like space and time, maybe a little like context is helpful here too. He's trying to chart like a third way with space and time between Newton and Leibniz. 
where like Newton thinks they both think of of space and time as being real, right? As being real features, either in Leibniz's sense of relations between things, like space is like the relation between two things, but it's a real relation external to the mind. So it's relative, right? We've got a relative conception of space and time there. And Newton thinks that space and time are absolute. They're like these empty containers that, again, really exist and would exist if there were no things that make them up or populate space and time. And Kant says these both, they both end up kind of having good arguments in favor of them, except they wind us, they land us in these sorts of antinomies, these weird, you know, sophistic dialectical problems. Aporias or whatever. Exactly, right? We're going to have these weird contradictions. Is space infinitely divisible or not? And he's like, the answer is, I don't know, because you keep talking (laughs) about it outside of the form of sensibility is like a real thing. So he's like, against Leibniz, I maintain that there is a kind of an absoluteness to space, but only insofar as it's a form of sensibility. Like you said, the form in which things have to appear. It's to our absolute. It's our absolute. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. I mean, it's weird, but yeah. <laughs> and against Newton, he's like, it doesn't actually make sense to say that space is absolute in the sense that like, if there was no stuff, there'd still be space. He's like, what are you talking about? This is why he calls his position transcendental idealism. He's like, I think that space and time are ideal in the sense that like they're part of our structuring feature of cognition, right? This is how things things have to appear to us in space and time. And again, he's like, could there be other ways that things could appear to non-human cognizers? Like, maybe, but I'm working with this apparatus and this is what I can say about it. So yeah, that's the sort of first level, right? This transcendental aesthetic, as he puts it in the critique, first step here, he gets it with the analysis of mathematics. You know, we have the concept of number because of succession in time. We have this idea of space because of this geometric propositions based on our sort of analysis of space. But these are just forms of intuition, right? These are just the shape in which things can appear to us or be given to us. There's this essay, I assume it precedes the critique, and I don't know when it was written. He's got some cool little essays, obviously, sprinkled throughout the big works, you know, like on Perpetual Peace, or as people may be familiar on, you know, lying in the philanthropic sense, right? Like, lying is bad. Don't save your friend from the murderer at the door. (laughs) He has an essay on what he calls Vernunftglaube, right? This faith in reason. Mm. And basically, it seems to be... The context, at least I'm trying to get, and obviously you've, you've kind of sketched out the middle pass he's working through, which is very helpful. But one of the things was that we have to sort of start with this faith in how reason can proceed. Right. In other words, how it can proceed to give us this framework for thinking the, the, the constitutive, you know, pureness of sensibility to think sort of the totality of, of appearances or the constitutive pureness of understanding to think about the law giving formal method. And, and I guess that what was interesting in that essay about this faith and reason is that if we don't start with this, if we perhaps start with the skeptical position or even maybe a dogmatic one, then it doesn't feel like we can begin at all because of this threat of chaos. Yeah. Because <laughs> I think I think in the background when I was reading this, because we did what is philosophy or the first half of it a couple of weeks ago. And one of the things that I thought was interesting, obviously they have different ideas of concept creation, right? Deleuze and Guattari versus Kant. You know, Kant is kind of, I think in a certain sense, the concept for him is about in a certain way what the understanding does in order for the synthetic a priori you know in order for this realm of appearances to work circumscribed but that's another thing the thing was about you know the and guattari made clear that philosophy science art they're all creative and the ways in which they are creative is they're different ways of kind of like sectioning off seeding through chaos and providing consistencies on the on the plane or whatever yeah and I do feel like there is something, it seems in the background of the way Kant's trying to proceed is with this thread of kind of chaos in the background. And I, and maybe this is going too far, but I, I wonder if there's something to that, because I do think for Kant, for reason to function, we kind of have to start with this belief in it, in its power. Otherwise, we can't get past that skepticism yeah. or cynicism. That's right. Like I said before, there's like these moments where he punts, right? And this is one of them, the fact of experience or the fact of cognition. But he can say to the skeptic, he's like, look, it's not the case. He says things like, if it weren't for the activity of the synthetic unity of apperception, this sort of cognizing activity of thought, of judgment, 
what would experience look like? And he's like, it would be that chaos, right? right. It would be yeah. that unintelligible flux of, I don't know what sense data. It'd be just like colors and shapes smashing into my eyes and I wouldn't make any sense of anything. I wouldn't have, it wouldn't be this thing in front of me right now. It wouldn't be a microphone, which is a thing that has unity. It'd be just stuff. It'd just yeah. be chaotic. Yeah. And he's like, good news. Things are unified. Things do yeah. appear to us as objects. It's not chaos against the empiricists who like Locke says. There's the no all perceptions or whatever. Or... Yeah. He's like, that's not a good enough. Actually, that's not a good enough account of like how experience works because it's not chaotic. And at the same time, I don't get the idea of unity from experience. I don't get the idea of necessity from experience. That's something that I synthesize in making experience possible, right? I see this thing as a unity, not just as like random blooming, buzzing manifold is one of the things he says. So there's a sort of that could be unsatisfying, I guess. But I think his his move is to say, like, it's already not chaotic. Our job is to explain how that's possible. And yeah. the answer to that can't be, oh, I just learned it from experience or by habit. He's like, no, experience wouldn't have been possible in the first place if there wasn't this organizing synthetic function that right. the mind does when it you know encounters the world, constitutes experience. There was a couple of things, I guess, to harken back to this geometrical stuff and, and why it can perhaps help with the the synthetic a priori is it reminded me of a scene in the Mino, probably the most famous, right? Where Socrates is leading the slave child yeah. through thinking about the triangle and how the knowledge of the a squared plus b squared equals c squared to calculate the hypotenuse of the triangle is almost, it's innate, yeah. so to speak. And it's just the soul reminiscing, if you will. And I think that there's something, there's a kind of, classical, if you will, or even quasi mythological synthetic a priori in this demonstration, except that Kant obviously does not want that would be a transcendent use of the understanding or reason or whatever, because it would it would go beyond experience to metempsychosis reliving another life, but also, but I think maybe something about the innateness is kept if metempsychosis or, you know, rebirth is foreclosed innateness takes on a new feature. And I suppose that's why I think the geometrical demonstrations kind of remind me of there are examples of this in the history of philosophy. They just, they take a totally new turn in the transcendental. That's exactly right. And I think that there's a way to make sense of, I've had that thought too, like the Plato-Kant connection. There's a way to see Kant as doing something like updating Plato. He's, he's got some nice things to say about Plato in the, uh, toward the end of the first critique, actually. But like, you know, if you think about, you know, the Mino's about virtue, right? And the problem Socrates always has whenever he's trying to get a definition hammered down is that people just point to examples. And he's like, the example is not a definition. Right. In fact, you already have the idea of virtue. And we know that because that's what lets you identify this as an example. You couldn't have abstracted yes. the idea from the example. It's the other way around. Right. Kant's doing the exact same thing thing, the exact same move, except it's not virtue. It's not justice. It's not the good. It's space and time and the 12 categories. And yeah. these are like the things that make it possible for experience to have the shape that it does, where things are unified and seem to have a consistency and a logic about them. Those are innate ideas for him, right? And this is one of his, again, his problem with Locke, who he thinks gets a lot right. He thinks Locke gets more right than I think. He's like, yeah, you know, Locke denies that there are any innate ideas. And he's like, okay, where'd unity come from? And you can't derive that from experience because there are unified objects is part of what makes experience possible in the first place. So for him, like all of these things, he'll say like the technical language, he's like, you know, these ideas, pure concepts of the understanding or the categories have their origin in seat a priori in the synthetic unity of cognition, right? This is what innately belongs to minds like ours, that they have space and time and that they have these 12 categories that sort of synthesize or unify things into coherent experience. No, this is great. This is great. And I think that one thing just to justify why perhaps the prolegomena is an interesting read is, you know, I was just kind of looking at the, the intro to the text and we've been talking about Hume and it seems like the often or at least celebrated quote about Hume waking him, waking Kant from his dogmatic slumber appears in the prolegomena, yes. at least it doesn't, it doesn't appear elsewhere. So this right. kind of an interesting, that at least gives it a historical interest, even if one is skeptical about if it's doing anything besides kind of summarizing 
or giving a simplified version of the critique in an outline, it does seem an interesting, it gives a new sort of depth to, to who, to Hume, to whom uh, God <laughs> is, is, uh, is reacting. I think people often forget that because you assume that he'd say something like that in the critique. In fact, Hume only comes up like a handful of times in the first critique. And in the, in the A edition, the initial edition, he comes up even less. He adds more references to Hume in the B edition. Uh, and he writes the prolegomena in between those two, right? And so like the only uh, only a couple of times in the in the critique, Hume comes up in the doctrine of method towards the end where he's talking about the so-called discipline of pure reason. And he basically identifies Hume as having taken like the correct skeptical step, but doesn't get all the way to a critique, right? He doesn't get all the way to a critique of pure reason. He says basically that, you know, the sort of skepticism, the language he uses is like, he effectively pulls off the censure of pure reason, right? Like we're censoring it, but like yeah. we're not actually drawing the boundaries of what we can legitimately know and talk about, which for Kant is possible experience mm -hmm. beyond which we don't get to have knowledge at all. But it's also very funny in the prolegomena. He's like, so like when he talks, I think it's in the preface or the preamble of this yeah. too many parts of the book, whatever, where he says something like it is positively painful to see other people reading Hume and not understanding what this dude was on about. He talks about like Beatty and Reed and he's like, these morons yeah, are just yeah. reducing this to like skeptical common sense and he's like and they don't understand that hume's on to something really important and that his project is designed to handle this problem of how it is possible for us to have knowledge in this way and he thinks that the only way to, to really pull that off right is to identify the categories as belonging already in an innately way to the transcendental subject to this transcendental subject so i don't know jumping forward to maybe like you know thinking about how this gets picked up by Deleuze, right? Which I know mm -hmm. is like a primary interest for you guys. You know, he writes the Kant book, says it's his only book that he wrote about an enemy, but what a great enemy to have in Kant. <laughs> right, right. And it's a wonderful little text. It's kind of an amazing synthetic overview of like the whole of Kant's system in like 50 pages. It's ridiculous. But like, why would this be, why would Kant be an enemy for someone like Deleuze? And I think there's a couple of reasons. One is that like, it gives too much pride of place, maybe, to the subject as something that's already constituted, where Deleuze yep. wants to get us back behind that to the sort of processes of becoming in which a subject might emerge, but which isn't itself kind of like the constituting, <clears throat> organizing thing. So that's one part of the problem. He also, I think, is bothered by Kant's modesty in a lot of ways. The point of the critique and the critical project is to really radically restrict the scope of legitimate philosophical inquiry or investigation, right? Yep. We no longer get to talk about nature, quote, in itself or the world or God or the soul. Like all of that stuff is revealed to be dialectical for Kant. That means sophistical, illusory, necessary illusions, right? Like you said before, it's not our fault that we don't see the retrograde movement of the stars correctly, but, you know, still illegitimate, transcendent usage of these categories, things that we need to refrain from doing now that we've mm -hmm. done the good work of critique. And I think Deleuze wants to retain some of the sort of skeptical, I'm sorry, not skeptical, speculative, mm -hmm. uh, the sort of speculative impulses of pre-critical philosophy that we do get with people like Leibniz and Spinoza, right? Who are going to talk a lot about God, actually. Yeah. And like, you know, maybe in a secular form, Deleuze wants to keep that. He doesn't want to just say, here there be dragons, don't talk about God any longer. He's like, no, 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 there's something important about I don't know, going beyond the limits of what this, you know, finite cognition looks like if we're going to create concepts, if we're going to have adequate understanding. Kant just thinks that you're going to be making mistakes when you do that. But I think for someone like Deleuze, I don't know, maybe it's worth the risk. I do think that that's right. And I do feel like, I think it's interesting to see when Kant is an enemy, but when he's also a friend, because mm -hmm. there is something we, we talked about this with Dan last week, and it's very clear that especially in difference repetition and logic of sense, at least Kant shows the way in which speculating about the world self and God need to be restrained or at least have a new, as you said, modesty. And I think Deleuze will take up that challenge of dissolving the self or sort of showing the chaosmos in the world mm -hmm. or sort of as I put it, you know, showing the, the anti-God, the counter, the counter God in, uh, in the dice throw, whatever. And so taking up this nod to Kant, but as, as you put it, you know, trying to rethink the transcendental field, right? Because yeah. he gives, 
he gives like I was I was trying to tell this to to Coop right that that you're exactly right. It's he appreciates someone like Sartre for making the transcendental ego completely impersonal and yeah. sort of and sort of sort of getting rid of the the uh, or sort of complicating the I. But at the same time, he thinks it hasn't gone far enough to pre-individual singularities, blah, blah, blah. I mean, this is why I always found the footnote to Simon Don and um, Logic mm -hmm. of Sense so interesting because he's like, Simon Don's got a new theory of the transcendental. It thinks of it as a field with, you know, a pre-individual milieu with, with these forces and all of this. And I do think that at that point, you know, when you're trying to think individuation, just to like bring to bear kind of Simon Don's basic point. I would say, and I was thinking this earlier, I would say that there is still kind of a hylomorphism in Kant, mm -hmm. right? It's just that matter and form, matter for Kant has now become the totality of appearances within which sensibility is restrained and form is the law giving function of pure and universal valid experience by the understanding. So you're still sort of within this hylomorphic structure. It's just kind of become transcendentalized, i.e. Yeah. like made imminent to consciousness. That's what you're getting at, I think, a little bit with also what Deleuze is wary of, for example, you know, taking up Nietzsche, because I do feel like Nietzsche is the is one of those post Kantians. I know sometimes he's not thought that way, but I was sharing screenshots with Coop yesterday from Beyond Good and Evil, where he's laughing at Kant mm. about why are synthetic a priori judgments necessary? Mm. You know, it's necessary for us to kind of ward off and scaffold the fact that life makes use of falsity, makes mm. use of these illusions mm -hmm. to, to sort of, to, well, to speak in the way you mentioned it, to drive itself forward, to sort of have material. And so to, to kind of make this the scaffolding and just say, no, it's okay. We can just be within appearance. I, I do yeah. think that this is where the, how the true world finally became a fable, right? Where he's like, you know, you lose the true world and the apparent world, right? There's, there's this, you know, the, the you kind of have to embrace fiction or falsity in, in its power for life. But anyway, I, I kind of went all over the place. I was just piggybacking off of your forward looking, this is what we have to look forward to because we're going to do the Hume book. We're going to do yeah. a system of subjectivity and we're going to do uh, the Kant book. So you're, you're giving us the strength to carry on. <laughs> well, I can just say a few other things about like yeah, problems, please. the problems that Kant leaves us with, right? Because okay. there's a lot that I think we can say is really powerful and important and obviously really significant about this sort of revolution that Kant pulls off with the first critique, but it does leave us with some problems, right? And one of them is, as he pointed out, this kind of weird dualism, form and matter is retained now, but in the form of like matter is intuition that's given to us and form is just like what the understanding imposes upon it. And like, okay, how's that work, right? We've got this sensibility that can be affected by other things. He's not Barclay, who says there are no things in themselves. There are only appearances. He's like, no, there are things in themselves. There are noumena that you know actually affects us, right? Real stuff out there that affects our sensibility somehow. And then you go, okay, how though? And the answer is, I don't have any answer for that question. And I kind of can't from within the yeah. system, right? This yeah. is, Jacobi makes this critique really early on. Maimon has a similar critique. And it's something like this, right? Like we've said that we can't say anything about, we can't know anything about things in themselves, right? I can only know things as they appear to me or appearances, objects of experience. But like that appearance, it's something that's appearing, right? What's that thing that's appearing? And the answer is the thing in itself. That sure sounds like you're making a causal claim about a thing in itself, right? It sure sounds like you're saying that thing in itself out there really is the cause of my being affected. And like, how's that supposed to work, right? So this is why Jacoby famously says, he's like, I can't get into the system without supposing that there's a thing in itself. And once I'm within the system, I can't do the thing in itself reference any longer. There's yeah. a kind of contradiction here. So like, how are we going to square that? And then the other like sort of problem is, yeah, I mean, if Kant's modest, he's also pious. This is like some of the most Protestant philosophy you could possibly work out. You know, he says things toward the end of the first critique and really quickly here in the third part about God, right? He's got a long, long critique of the ontological argument in the first critique. And he's basically like, look, any argument for the existence of God fails. And it can't play any role in our theoretical cognition. It's got the idea of God has nothing to teach us or to do with how we make sense of things. But 
sure is nice to have this idea for moral and practical purposes though and it's like i yep. guess dude yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> real pious and he says things like yeah in fact i need to part of what i'm doing by limiting the boundaries of legitimate knowledge is making room for faith to go back to your faith and knowledge thing it's a sort of old canard right of theological thought like if indeed god's existence in nature were like demonstrable like would there be any need for faith that seems like a problem actually if faith is right. important and Kant's very much on that tip. He's like, yeah, no, I cannot prove. It's not that I haven't done a good enough job yet with my argument for the existence of God. No such argument could be satisfying because it refers to an object that's not something that we can possibly experience, right? So I can't know it, can't know its existence. Sure do like having this idea though. And like, you know, as part of this like architecture of the progress of thought and, you know, this like moral imperative to like continually drive forward in a, in a morally upright way, right? The other sort of critique that Deleuze is going to have is this idea of like, he says quite a bit, Kant says a lot about, about like how unsatisfying common sense is. And Deleuze is like, sure seems like you're presupposing something like the good sense of common sense still, right? That you're presupposing that thought works, that cognition, it's happening. We can just point to it. I think for Deleuze, thought cognition is much rarer, much harder to execute or to pull off. And it's, a, I mean, in his language, like it's the result of like a painful encounter. It's not a yep. given, yep. right? It's not a given that just like thought happens, which Kant does just take for granted. And again, this is the sort of thing that all of the post-Kantians are going to be like, you need to show me like where that comes from. And it's not enough to just be like, I don't know, cognition seems to work, right? So this is where problematics being or problems being the the what is it the incentive not the incentive to thought but the generate thought etc encountering problems in the world or what causes moves us to a think etc yeah exactly and Kant's already got a theory of ideas as being problematic right yep. this is like the third part of the book in uh the first critique this is what maps onto the transcendental dialectic like i said you get the three ideas of reason our self world and god and they're problematic ideas not because like there's going to be a solution to them, but because they have to sort of be posited, but which can't be objects of thought or of experience, right? right. They, they can't actually appear, but we like posit these objects problematically. And the interesting or cool thing I think about this account that Kant gives us is he thinks that this isn't the result of something other than understanding in a sense. It's just understanding going a step too far, right? And right. so like, he'll always say like, look, when when I understand something, I'm trying to take the thing that I'm understanding and attach it to its condition. Its condition, what are its conditions? And that's what the work of understanding does. And reason is just going all the way with that, right? If something's conditioned, not only does it have a condition, there must be something unconditional, like beneath it, behind it, all the way. So this is in the case of the cosmological idea, the whole series of cause and effect, going all the way back to the start, or if there's not a first, going back infinitely or eternally. This would be the unconditional that seems to be given when something conditioned appears because reasons like, I don't think it makes sense to say that this thing is conditioned, but there's not a condition for it. So it's the same movement of thought that brings us all the way to the infinite or to the absolute, which for Kant is like, you know, illusory, but it makes sense that we'd go there. It's just the same activity of understanding, kind of losing sight of the fact that it has limits, that it is finite. Again, all the all the post Kantians are going to be like, I don't know. It sure, seems like thought's infinite. Actually, I don't know how you got to the finite without presupposing the infinite in some way or another. What does that look like? This is good, especially given what you and Cooper are just talking about, where you know Deleuze will be interested in the genesis of thinking within thinking, right? The right. thought's genitality, which is a kind of phrase I think he, I believe he gets from Arto, but I I'd have to go back and look. But in any that sounds, case, that sounds like Arto. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but in any case, you see. Kant a few times in the prolegomena, and I'm not sure if I'm getting this right, but he he keeps kind of a refrain, a lesser refrain than the in general that I brought up earlier, is how he's not interested in the genesis or the generation of these concepts, right? Because right. that's that seems to already be a given with how the law imposing formality of the constitution of understanding works. But he's like, that's not our issue that's not a problem and i think that that seems to be something like you brought up Maimon. he's interested in this right the yeah. genetic conditions of real experience rather than right. possible experience this is what deliz will also take up right yep. so it's so it is this question about there do seem to be these as you put it the, these these problems that kant leaves us with or, or some of the things he punts on as you put it that generate 
more thinking, ironically speaking enough, you know, it's, it's not something that's, that's satisfactory. And, um, this is why it's, it's almost a meme nowadays to talk about the completion of German idealism. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So yeah, we, you mean communism? Exactly. I mean, <laughs> uh, yes, that's, I mean, that itself is a, is an interesting, I, I brought up perpetual peace in, in this kind of shit, yeah. right? So you, yeah. you would wonder, you would wonder what a, what a Kantian communism might be. And I don't know if it's more or less scary than a, than a Heideggerian <laughs> communism. Well, I tend to run away from all things Heideggerian, even without needing to like think about it so that that'd be my guess i'd have to think about it i, I think you um, mean withdrawal but i do withdraw i would withdraw. <laughs> yeah withdraw. that's part of the that's part of the language i was thinking about this too and we can get off heidegger uh soon i i, I apologize <laughs> but this notion of the thing in itself not being accessible does feel like it's taken up as a theme in the withdrawal that heidegger kind of makes into a big part of his way of dealing with you know, grounding his phenomenology, the things withdraw uh, sort of of themselves. And as Grant Harmon would say, not just from us, but from from each other, right? This constitutive withdrawal is at the grounding of circumscribing appearances. Yeah, I mean, I don't have too much to say about Heidegger other than that, like, it definitely does belong to this like post Kantian lineage and that phenomenology comes directly out of this kind of in this what I've called this inversion or the flipping of the script that we get with Heide with uh, with Kant. I also wanted to say, if there's like a problem of generativity, it is that, you know, why these 12 concepts and categories and no others? Are we done? Like, you know, are there no more categories or concepts to find? And like Kant talks pretty decisively on this score about how like, you know, even if this isn't quite done yet, the system of concepts is innumerable in total and it'll be done soon. We're working on it. We're going to get there. And I think that there's something about that, which is like, if I talked about him being modest before, that's like completely immodest, right? Like yeah. a wild claim to be like, oh, no, well, you can just like enumerate the totality of possible concepts. I think for someone like Deleuze, maybe, you know, for better or worse, like the fascination with novelty of Genesis means that like that just as like a assumption or a presupposition is anathema. Why would you think that we can just like get the complete set of concepts laid out in this way? One other thing I wanted to point to is like a weird sort of, again, problem that Kant leaves us with. I was talking before about like this finite infinity thing. He says in the first critique so many times, just look at it, go look at these like passages. He says things like, look, we're finite, co we're finite cognition. We have this form of sensibility, which is a receptivity. Things are given to us. Yeah. And he says all the time, if we were infinite cognizers, if we had infinite cognition, we wouldn't be given objects. We would create the objects of our experience. And like, what man what are you talking about like this again is like a moment where it's like i don't know how based on your own strictures you have license to make a claim like that and then you know this is where like again maimon but also fichte Schelling are going to talk about infinite understanding infinite intu intuition or the infinite intellect of which maybe we're a part and now we got like i don't know weird panpsychism can be read into like the post-kantian tradition it's one of those moments where it's it's really unclear how he has the right to make that sort of claim and yet it doesn't seem like it makes sense to draw the contrasts that he draws without something like a reference to an infinite intellect. And it's like really unclear how that's going to how that's going to play out with our good new critical restricted philosophy remaining within the boundaries of possible experience and all that. I do remember this moment. It, it happens fairly early in the critique where it he does. brings up whatever it's translated as intellectual intuition or right. something like this, right, where where we are. Like if we are kind of it within the divine understanding, then now the noumena reveal themselves instead of withdrawing or whatever. <laughs> and it reminded me a little bit of of kind of, you know, his way of turning perhaps this notion of, you know, Spinoza, where the two attributes of substance that we are familiar with is extension and, and uh, thought and extension, right? But that there's possibly an infinite variety of attributes those are just the two with which we're familiar right. and it, yeah. it almost feels like Kant's kind of yeah rehashing this in a certain way um but I don't know I mean it, Spinoza may not have been the impetus for this but it, it did seem kind of like from the perspective of God there's this infinity of attributes within which to sort of play but within human finite reason we've got we've got just the two and I, I feel like that's perhaps at least it, it at least ha has a little bit of resonance with what Kant's trying to circumscribe with this thought experiment. 
Yeah, I think that's right. And Spinoza does say like, it's not just maybe, there definitely are an infinity of other attributes that pertain to the divine essence. And it's like, I guess that would have to be true. I don't have any idea what you're talking about and neither do you by your own admission. That's pretty cool. Yeah, this is again, one of those like odd moments of both like humility and like complete hubris Mm -hmm. in Kant where like it is, he's trying to say like, I'm just concerned with finite cognition with human cognition. And it sure looks like these are the 12, these are the categories. And this is like this form of space and time is pure form of intuition. Again, he literally will say like, why are these the things that constitute the human structure? Like no idea. I, I got nothing to say. And I think that there is a kind of speculative interest that you know philosophers metaphysicians tend to have of asking what why or what would be outside or beyond that right like if there is anything other than the structures of understanding with which we're familiar why would we restrict ourselves just to go nietzschean with it all to human cognition and kant's just i think response to that is to say speculate all you want i'm trying to be scientific here i'm trying to like you know restrict myself to what it is that i can say with any certainty and i have to restrict myself here to these things and you know you can say anything you want about what a non human cognizer might look like i don't know man that's your business i can't stop you but you have to admit that you're kind of just you know you're out on a limb at least right you're not able to demonstrate the way that i think i can that this stuff actually has a kind of necessity to it that this structure of, of cognition is is got the shape it does for good reasons that is you know look around this is the the way that experience is shaped there's this moment in anti oedipus where, where kant comes up and we've talked to a few people i think dan has said this i think charles Duvall has said this i think most recently Coop, you'd have to help me out here. I think most recently, maybe Brent Adkins has said this, where anti is supposed to be kind of like a fourth critique, right? Yeah. It's, it inherits this critical tradition. But one of the things, just thinking about this intellectual intuition stuff that, that gets pushed back on, you know, they bring up how with Kant, desire becomes productive, which they immediately follow mm. that, that it's, it's kind of a, a psychologistic, illusory productivity, but they quote Kant, desire is the faculty of being through its representations, the cause of the reality of the objects of these representations. Yeah. Right. And that sounds very much like what you were mentioning, where yeah. for a divine understanding or for intellect, you know, for this infinite un- sort of mind, if you will, its desire would kind of coincide with it's reason or it's other faculties or something yep. like this, right? Yep. Where it wouldn't just be the cause of the representations, but perhaps of the things in themselves. Yes. I don't know. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's right. I mean, like, so when he talks about, we're not dealing with like any of this here, but critique of practical reason. And then like, you know, the, the other works on practical philosophy, the groundwork and the metaphysics of morals, he says things like that exactly as you just said, right? When it comes to theoretical cognition, we're given objects to understand. And then of course, you know, the mind determines them in certain ways based on the structures of the categories. But in the the faculty of desire, it creates its object, unlike in the understanding, right? Mm-hmm. And so this is, you know, what are the objects of will? And then of course he thinks, you know, the best way to do that is to determine the objects of desire out of respect for the moral law, the uniform, the pure form of universality that's inherent to law, as of course, as opposed to like disgusting empirical desires, like for sandwiches or sex or whatever, which is horrible. And at that sec, that's heterogeneous, that's heteronymous. But yeah, there's, there's, he thinks that in this way, you know, we are like unto gods and like our ability to determine our wills and to produce the objects of our desire as objects of desire. And this requires a, co- a completely different like analysis, but then, then what we get with the sort of theoretical cognition stuff in the first and then weirdly in the third critique, which again, we're not talking about at all, what the relationship is there is kind of wild. I was going to say too, like the idea of anti Oedipus as a fourth critique, there's like a line in that book that I always, always think about and which I don't see, I think, quite emphasized or whatever. People have lots of great things to say about the book, but they say that it is a transcendental materialist analysis yeah. of, of desire. And by that, they mean, and they're like explicitly referring to Kant here, right? What do we mean by transcendental here? What we mean is we're going to determine or figure out what the sort of uh, principles are, and then we're going to determine a legitimate usage of them and then the illegitimate usage of them so as to restrict our analysis to just the imminent, the imminent forms of desire. So the three principles there are the connective, the disjunctive and the conjunctive. And in each case, right, they distinguish between like, here's the legitimate usage of it where like it stays within its limits. Here's what happens when we go beyond that and we get like, you know, the transcendent subject the transcendent 
the transcendent object of desire, the complete object as opposed to a partial yep. one. And this is exactly the same sort of thing that Kant is up to with the categories, right? He's like, look, when I talk about things having a unity or there being cause and effect, I can talk about that in experience of objects of experience. I can then take those same categories and apply them to things in themselves. And I'm going to land in all these problems, right? I'm going to get these contradictions or aporia. So there's something about that sort of inheritance again of like, what does it mean to do a transcendental analysis that I think Deleuze is interested in, in retaining some version of, even if again, he thinks that too much weight is given to the subject as opposed to a field mm -hmm. or, you know, treating it as constitutive when in fact it's a product, stuff like this. Right, I, right. I think that inheritance is important though. That's really great. And, and it is interesting that what Kant pushes back, you brought up Barclay earlier, what Kant pushes back is being labeled an idealist in Barclay's sense. And you've given reasons for this, but this was one of the, I think the, the first review, the one of the first reviews of the Critique of Pure Reason is, is this offhand remark that that Kant's doing something like Barclay, and he's like, yeah, and he gets he gets he's fucking so mad. He gets he gets very <laughs> mad. Don't don't put in the paper that Kant was mad, uh, but he, <laughs> he, he gets he gets very fucking mad he's about real pissed off being called Barclay because as we've kind of worked out, he's obviously trying to to do something different whether or not that works or is legitimate sure right. whatever but he's, he's he's obviously not kind of falling into some of the the weirdness that you brought up but i i do think it's interesting that it's not the idealism it's the un uh modified to core idealism that he pushes back against is that no if i have something i've called it a transcendental idealism right it's as though the word in itself weren't bad it's it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's its unmodified version and so i do think it's interesting too then and we've talked about transcendental empiricism many times and how that's almost a, a an interesting counterintuitive or counter kantian notion but i do think transcendental materialism as opposed to transcendental idealism you know there is something to that reversal because of what we've laid out, right? Because we are getting rid of the transcendental subject as the constitutive ground, right. or we're um, we're getting rid of perhaps these notions of you know a, a, you know phenomena noumena and, right. and stuff like this, right? I mean, I'm sure there's there's a lot more just off the top of my head, and it's not important. But I do think there's something interesting in as though Deleuze were still trying to you know claim the lineage of of the enemy, but frame it in a way that would still have a break right it's all it's like this imminent break or this inclusive yeah. disjunction yeah uh, yeah 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 i will say too that like he in the b edition after having gotten these reviews or whatever writes includes a refutation of idealism in the first critique and that my friends is like the least satisfying part of the whole ass book interesting it, it is really hard to give a charitable reading of that bit. He's like, yeah, no, uh, you know, I'm definitely not an idealist. Idealism doesn't work. I am a transcendental idealist and it's different. You know, as Deleuze himself emphasizes, transcendental idealism is also an empirical realism, right? Like Kant says all the time, I'm saying that like time and space aren't real. They're not things in themselves. What's real though, the sensations and the sensations yep. are caused by things. What are those things? I don't know. They're they're outside of the possible bounds of experience, but I, I know they're there. And it's like, I don't actually, again, I don't actually think you get to say that from within the system that you've constructed. And it is a thing that, yeah, it, it's very funny how mad he gets at the charge that he's an idealist. And he says here, yeah, you've got this quote pulled up, right? You know, idealism is the idea that there's nothing other than thinking things. The other things that we believe we perceive in intuition are only representations. And I say, no, there's definitely real stuff out there. I just, <laughs> I just don't know what it is or anything about them. And it's like, I, first of all, even if you can say that, I don't know how good of a solution that is, right? Like, what does that win you? Because I'm not allowed to say or know anything about those things. But I guess the system doesn't work without it. It's pretty unsatisfying, I have to say. There was a turn of phrase that seems to perhaps be picked up on Deleuze. I don't, I don't think he quotes it, but this is in passing when he talks about extensive magnitudes in the prolegomena. And he talks about... You mentioned this uh, in sensibility, you know, there is, there are these degrees yeah. of intensive magnitude in appearances. And he refers to that as, as they're real. I mean, yeah. I think, which I think is kind of interesting that I think Deleuze takes this up uh, and even goes wild with it in different repetition, right? Yeah. With intensive magnitude. But there's something else too, where 
I think Simon Don makes a lot of this where beyond an individuation, you know, beyond sort of even extensive and intensive magnitudes, what's going on is a kind of, you know, preliminary resonance between different orders of magnitude that aren't resolved beforehand, right? Because I think this is what Simon Don and perhaps Deleuze would, this is the genetic aspect where you can't start with, with concepts, you can't start with individuals to get back to the principle of individuation, right? right. And I think this is why Kant can't, right. Kant doesn't want to worry about Genesis, you know, because if you bring in Genesis, then you have to bring in individuation. And if you start from fully constituted terms, you can't think relations in a dynamic sense. This again is, you already mentioned this line of Maimon's, right? But Maimon says, look, the way that Kant goes about proving what he proves is to say, experience is actual, cognition is actual. Now I'm going to prove that it's possible. And now I'm going to talk about how is it possible? The categories, right? The synthetic yeah. unity of apperception. Maimon goes like, I actually think that I can't presuppose that experience is actual. I'm mm -hmm. not willing to bite mm -hmm. that bullet. And that sounds bananas, especially to the phenomenologists in the room, I would think, right? Like, yeah. what do you mean experience isn't actual? But he means exactly like the this, this technical sense that Kant gives to experience in the prolegomena. He distinguishes early on between judgments of sensation, I think, and or of perception. Yes. perception. And judgment. And yeah. judgments of experience. And by judgments of experience, he means not just that, like, I have a subjective experience of, like, I don't know, it's warm in this room. This is the sort of example he gives. But I say, no, I have an experience where there's an objective connection where I say the stove heats up the room. Right. Yeah. And my mom's like, brother, I'm sorry. I read my Hume. I don't actually think I have that experience where there is that objective necessity or the necessary connection there. So I can't suppose that experience is actual. And now your arguments about how it's possible. I'm like, maybe. Right. <laughs> like, is it possible experience? Is that true of possible experience? Perhaps. But because I don't even know if it's actual, that demonstration doesn't really work for me. So he thinks instead we need to move in the direction of a genetic account of real experience, which now has all of this other stuff that starts to sound kind of Deleuzean, in fact, right? Mm -hmm. Of there being an encounter where there's differentials of perception that kind of enter into relations combinatorially that produces something like an experience or a cognition. But Kant just kind of in this way stays at this hypothetical mode, right? Where he's like, you know, if it's true that experience is actual, here's what has to be correct about it in order for it to be possible. And I think for a lot of the post-Kantian idealists, they're like, that's pretty unsatisfying if you want to claim that this is like systematic and scientific philosophy, because that's a huge assumption, right? That this thing that you mean by experience is, is already actual. Are you sure, right? That is an interesting move just from the the judgments of perception to judgments of experience. It's as though judgments of perception were were merely on the level of kind of the way Hume says, yes. I, you know, I, I don't I don't think I have a self, but I have a bundle <laughs> of perceptions. Right. Right. And I feel like Kant wants to be like, well, no, you've got to have this, you know, you have to have this transcendental subject, right? That's that's able to accompany the I think that I think is able to accompany all of these. Yes you know, in, in the form of judgment. And that's, that's the consistent role of understanding that we've been talking about. And, and I guess I would just say one last thing, just to bring it back up, just because I think it's, it's been sort of in the ether, this notion of nature, you know, what is it, the, the famous, you know, the two things that fill me with wonder are the starry, you know, the moral law within me and the starry heavens above, but right. it seems like the starry heavens above nature now are all they're all internal, right? They're not really yeah. above. They're actually just sort of, whether we think of it like in a, in a more contemporary mode, they're just neurons firing or, or something, or right. you know what I mean? Like, cause there, there does feel like this, that you could have like a neurological Kant, right? That the, you know, we were talking to Dan, you mentioned panpsychism, talking to Dan about Ruye and it's like the embryo knows how to make the the transcendental apparatus, right? You know, it, it just kind of, if you follow Kant in that way, right? That the the faculties are inherent in the embryo and, and uh, you know, I don't know if he would, <laughs> if he would like that, right? Because it does, <laughs> it does still feel like there's, even if it's circumscribed, it does still feel like there has to be some kind of transcendent instance to make sure that we can trust, we can have this belief in reason that it has that the pure forms of understanding are universally valid and, and sort of work from the get-go.
so one of the versions of the problem that we get here, I like that point about the starry skies above because, yeah, what do you mean above? So it seems like within again, right? And this is like one of the problems, I guess, that like the Kantians have to try to solve or that the post-Kantians are interested in solving, which is like, how is this not just like a solipsistic subjectivism right. where even nature now seems to be a function of the determining power of my unifying activity as a thinker. And that's pretty thin, especially because when we get to the first part of the dialectic, which is the uh, paralogism of pure reason, which is about the soul or the self. Again, he's like, what do I know about this thing, this thinking thing? And the answer is nothing. I don't have any basis to give it personality, to give it unity, to give it subsistence. And there is a line in there that is one of the most, like, in the Deleuze Guattarian sense, like, most schizoid thing Kant ever wrote, which is where he's, like, asking him questions about this, this thinking self. And he says something like, yeah, well, this I or he or it, parentheses, the thing that thinks, like, what's true about it? And the answer is, I got nothing. And I'm not sure. And so if the ground for all of this stuff is this thinking transcendental unity, it's weird to at the same time insist that there's no knowledge of what the soul is in itself, right? But only as it appears to me, again, this starts to sort of, the system here starts to kind of like suffer under its own weight a little bit. That's interesting too, the, that one of the the very end of the critique of pure reason is called the architectonic, right? Yeah. As though there is this awareness that it needs a load bearing, you know, some load bearing beams to sort of support the weight of, of it all. Coop, I know you're, you're, you're searching through the document. Was there anything that, that jumped out to you in the reading that, that maybe was a no-go or something you wanted to, to delve deeper into? I recognize this shit from, what is it? I is not an other or something, or I is another or something like that, that kind of dinged in my head when I read this little passage mm -hmm. from Deleuze. Oh, this is good. This is good. Yeah. Yeah. I... Should I read this perhaps or? Yeah. Um... Read it. Read it. Now, it does appear as if we have something substantial in the consciousness of ourself, the thinking subject, and indeed have an, an immediate intuition. For all the predicates of inner sense are referred to the I as subject, and this I cannot again be thought as the predicate of some other subject. It therefore appears that in this case, completeness in referring the given concepts to a subject as predicates is not a mere idea, but that the object, namely the absolute subject itself, is given an experience. But this expectation is disappointed, for the I is not a concept at all, but only a designation of the object of inner sense, insofar as we do not further cognize it through any predicate. Hence, although it cannot itself be the predicate of another thing, just as little can it be a determinant concept of an absolute subject, but as in all the other cases, it can only be the referring of inner experiences to their unknown subject. Nevertheless, through a wholly natural misunderstanding, this idea, which as a regular regulative principle serves perfectly well to destroy completely all materialistic explanations of the inner appearances of our soul citation needed gives rise to a seemingly plausible argument for inferring the nature of our thinking being from the presumed cognition of the substantial in it in as much as knowledge of its nature falls completely outside the sum of total experience or some total of experience <clears throat> Yeah, this is actually an opportunity to say something else about Kant's sort of overall way of thinking, which is that the understanding for him is discursive. He uses this language of the understanding being discursive, mm -hmm. by which we mean like it thinks through concepts, it applies predicates to things. So this idea of an absolute subject, right, the thing underlying all of this, he's like, what happens when we strip away all of the predicates that we could use to identify a particular subject? And the answer is, well, we're left with nothing because the understanding works through applying concepts or predicates so if you pull all of those away you're not left with a coherent idea of like an of an uh, of an absolute eye underneath it all you're left with nothing having stripped away all of these all of these predicates and this maybe is like to jump forward to uh, i was trying to think about how to talk coherently about heidegger i think this is something that heidegger quite dislikes about kant that understanding mm. is discursive he wants us to develop alternative modes of thinking that are non-discursive, that are non-conceptual. But Kant just thinks that, again, like this just is the way that the understanding works. So, you know, if you want to talk about what is the subject devoid of all of its discursive characteristics, he's like, you got a nothing on your hands. And so at the same time, I can be attached to every thought, but that doesn't give me a determinate concept of an object in this sort of sense. So it'd be like Stirner, although I don't think in reading Hegel, I thought that 
Sterner would be like the the categories would kind of be the spooks, but I don't know if that's necessarily right. But I think maybe this kind of goes to the same critique Sterner is making with regard to the creative nothing, and mm. you know the spooks are sort of these transcendent categories or tran- mm-hmm. I don't know that I use it this time. I don't no, know. It's, it's transcendent. Yeah, you're right. So, um, yeah. I don't know. That's just kind of what popped in my head. Well, I mean, like last thought about the connection there too. I don't know very much about Sterner, but I can say that the question of what Hegel is up to. The transcendental deduction that we get in the first critique is this right attempt at deriving these fundamental categories that organize experience. And Hegel, again, thinks, you sure there's only 12? I actually think there's a whole lot more. And this is the whole science of logic is him being like, okay, starting with being the most yep. empty, the emptiest concept, I'm going to deduce every category that is, a, as he puts it, thought determination. And that's going to get us everything so like the the table of categories is not 12 strong for hegel it's hundreds and all of them can be deduced from pure thought thinking itself again much more speculative and ambitious aim than this kind of modesty we get with kant and you know he thinks it answers to questions that kant can't reply to properly this other thing that and i don't know if we have enough time for this i know we 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 can we can start to to wind down but that was that was good to to bring in hegel for for a minute because you know so much of Zizek shtick when he's not bringing in Lacan to do these things is to kind of play Kant and Hegel off each other, obviously side with Hegel. But one of the things that um, Deleuze seems to not care for and that becomes, and again, he picks up kind of from Marteau, perhaps with to have done with the judgment of God, but it's this notion that conceptual thinking or thinking in general, creation in general, goes by way of, of judgment. Again, a, a quasi halomorphic melding of subject and predicate, as you put it in this uh, this discursive way. And yeah. I'm not sure if Deleuze, well, I think with Guattari, at the very least, discursivity is schizophrenized and made much different in the semiotic framework. But I don't think that thinking by way of judgment is uh, survives under Deleuze's hands. The thing that I'll add to that, because I think that's absolutely right. Uh, and the thing that I'll add to that is that there's a moment in the third critique that Deleuze is like unsurprisingly quite fond of, right? Mm-hmm. In the third critique, Kant starts talking about there being two different kinds of judgment. There's determining judgment, where I subsume a particular under under a concept. And then there's reflective judgment, where I don't have a concept for the thing that I'm trying to understand. And a judgment now, this calls for the creation of a kind of concept that doesn't mm-hmm. yet exist. And he thinks that this is an important idea for making sense of what's going on with art, with like genius and productivity and creativity. But there's a kind of judgment for Kant now where it produces the space for like a productive imagination to generate a new conceptual sort of architecture. And this, of course, Deleuze is like, nice. Hey, hey, this is the stuff right here. (laughs) Um, But it's the determining judgment or the terminative judgment where like, you know, I've got the concept already. I'm just going to kind of apply it that I think is is what. You're completely right. Deleuze thinks is a much too restrictive way of making sense of what it is that thought is up to or what the activity of thinking is. In first critique Kant, it's determining judgment all the way down. We are determining and that's that's the activity of thinking. He says things like, you know, the faculty of thinking is the faculty of judging in general. And I think for for someone like Kant, that's I'm sorry, for someone like Deleuze, that's uh, not going to be satisfying. Yeah, I forget there was a definition of thinking that basically associated it with with what the understanding is doing right yeah. it's just it's just sort of unifying representations in a in, in a quote-unquote experience right in, and according to rules yeah. according to rules right and that's that just seems it's a little too surgical right it's a little yeah. it's not messy enough right as, <laughs> as, as as you brought up right it's not it doesn't doesn't get to the the messiness of the genitality of, of thinking but uh we definitely have talked a lot We've gotten to about that two hour mark. I guess, you know, I do want to give you a chance, maybe if you will, to obviously plug your book, your translation. And if you want to, uh, if there's anything in the future, I know you and I have said perhaps once we've sort of maybe over the summer, we can talk more about this, but you and I have talked about collaborating. There's all kinds of stuff we could uh, translate together. Obviously that, that takes a lot of prior work because most presses if they would take up the the project at all they would want to have grant stuff so that's really uh where the groundwork would go but i do want to i do want you to talk a little bit about your recent publications and and whatever else comes to mind 
first of all, I want to say thank you both for having me. This was really great. I really enjoyed this discussion. We appreciate you so much, man. So yeah, a couple of, what have I been up to recently? My book just came out in August. It is The Unconscious of Thought in Leibniz, Spinoza, and Hume. I make the case in a kind of semi-anachronistic way that these three thinkers already kind of had a kind of operative understanding of unconscious dimensions of thought that they didn't identify thinking and consciousness, which is a sort of heterodox claim. Usually people, when they kind of give a chronology or genealogy of the idea of the unconscious, you know, most obviously we're tracing it back to Freud. There are precursors, but most people don't think that we have a kind of idea of the unconscious back in the 1600s. I make the case that like, you know, none of their ways of talking about how perception works in the case of Leibniz mm -hmm. makes sense unless there's already something like unconscious perception happening. Or in the case of Hume, who we talked about a lot today, his way of thinking or talking about, you know, what is the movement of thought? And it's a habit of drawing connections. Well, habits tend to be formed unconsciously and to operate yep. unconsciously. You know, it's a non-psychoanalytic concept of the unconscious that I'm sort of excavating from their philosophical systems. And I think it might have some helpful explanatory power. I'm obsessed with political issues concerning like, you know, ideology, ideology critique. I think there's cool resources there that I'm trying to like pull out to contribute to a project like that. It's also very expensive. Tell your school libraries to order a copy. The other thing that I've got that just came out just recently, just like a couple of weeks ago, is a translation, as you mentioned, of um, Francoise Zorapachvili's book, Spinoza's Paradoxical Conservatism. We said before, I think before we hit record, some of your fans of this show might be more familiar with Zorapachvili than most because he was one of Deleuze's students and wrote an extremely excellent pair of books on Deleuze that were published together as Deleuze, The Philosophy of the Event, I think in like 2012 or something. It's excellent mm -hmm. work. Yeah. In 2002, he also wrote two books on Spinoza, which what I just translated is one. I think it's an excellent, really cool book. I can make the case for why in just a few words. I think that the general sort of organizing problem that he's interested in is the problem of like transformation or of change, mm -hmm. which given some really basic commitments in Spinoza's metaphysics is actually a really thorny problem where like, you know, if the essence of any given thing is to strive to persevere in its being, right. how could anyone or anything strive to be otherwise, right? right. Or to right. become other. So in particular, he's like interested in, I think that this is a kind of nice rejoinder, let's say, to some readers of Spinoza who want to assimilate his philosophy, I think, a little too quickly and easily to like transformative political projects, like, you know, Hart and Negri, for instance, mm -hmm. make it sound like, obviously, the multitude wants to, you know, become other than it is in the form of a new communism or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I think if you're a Spinozist, that's actually pretty hard to say. Things tend to strive to persevere in what they are. Mm -hmm. So the conservatism here isn't like, isn't conservatism in the sense of like, you know, let's fight progressive values or whatever, you know, continue to entrench hierarchies like the way Corey Robin defines it. It's more like, no, even in Spinoza's political works, what he's looking for are conditions for maximal stability or conditions for self-preservation, even in regimes that have a kind of inherent instability. So he's got a great, fascinating analysis of what's going on in Spinoza's reading of absolute monarchy. Historical context there is really cool. There's a whole chapter on Louis XIV, the Sun King, which is wild. And then the other thing that's really great about the book, and I think it's most original contribution is what he has to say about Spinoza and childhood, because hmm. the idea of like growing up as like a, a thematic for exploring this problem of change or transformation over time turns out to be, you know, Zerbitri is brilliant in a lot of ways. But one of the things he's so good at is like noticing stuff that other people might not have like picked up on. Because when you first say like, okay, what's Spinoza's concept of childhood? Like even me, who's read like almost everything Spinoza wrote, I'm like, I don't know, does he talk about childhood at all? And then Zerbich really is like, yeah, look at all these important points where it comes up and it's a really well-developed account. Really cool stuff. The chapters on childhood are, are really cool. And in general, I think it's a really exciting text and I'm looking forward to seeing what people have to say about it. I also think I'm in talks with someone to translate his other Spinoza book, which is A Physics of Thought. We're in talks about that now. I don't know if it's going to happen, but we're, we're moving on it. And then, yeah, I'd love to translate some stuff with you. We'll figure it out as we go forward. Other than that, I'm on Twitter at GD Morejon, and I do have my own podcast, as you mentioned at the beginning, What's Left of Philosophy, which comes out every two weeks. We are currently prepping our next episode, which will be on Gramsci and his book, The Modern Prince, his reading cool. of Machiavelli, which would be Ooh, nice. Cool. Yeah. 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 I mean, we'll obviously put all those links in the... Uh in the show notes. And um, yeah, definitely, man. I mean, uh, something definitely we should talk about because because of my Deleuze kick, you know, which we share, I, I'm, I'm interested in a lot of these French 
thinkers who've written books on Spinoza. I mentioned the one that's perhaps the biggest that I can think of that's that's interesting is uh, the Matheron. But, yep. you know, as I said, we'll be able to talk about that later. I just can't tell you how much uh, I appreciate you jumping in and making this conversation so dynamic and uh, and, and really, really helping to, to give the architectonic of our <laughs> discussion today. Well, that's, uh, you know, pure reason's got to have its defenders. I'm out here, baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would have been totally at a loss uh, a lot of the time here. So thanks for helping out there. My pleasure. Guys. I, well, it's it's you know it's funny is I keep using the meme. You've probably seen it, Gil, is the the one where it's like at the top it's this Reddit. I guess it's 4chan where it's talking about Khan and his use of coffee and how he would cry out to his butler to bring him coffee. Have you seen the the meme? <laughs> no, I don't know this one. <laughs> uh, Coop, do you want to bring this up? I was thinking about though as well when Gil, you were mentioning, I guess this being stuck in your sort of ways about what is it a. Uh, Freud says in melancholy and melancholia about yeah, morning, morning and melancholia. Yeah. We never, uh, you never willingly give up a libidinal position, even <laughs> if there's a substitute available. There's also this uh, quote in Dune where they're like the Tleilaxu, who they created their own fucking Quitsats Haderach and he killed himself because something will resist becoming its opposite, basically. Yeah. So I think this is, yeah, this is the one. Emmanuel Kant drank a lot of coffee when he didn't have a cup. For a while, he became distraught and would cry, I am drowning. This was the sign for his servants to bring him a new cup of coffee, molto pronto. <laughs> when he saw it arriving, he would cry, land, my dear friends, I see land. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what I I, I think of uh, recently with, with Kant. And, uh, <laughs> you know, we all need our, our things. But I'm glad that, uh, I'm glad you brought up that Dune reference, Coop. You know, it's, that fits actually pretty well. And the libidinal position, that's a good point to bring up. It does feel kind of like, I mean, I, I mean, is the resistance to change, right? Like that's kind of goes to Freud and like the analytic situation a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're so libidinally invested in these yeah. particular whatever objects of desire, et cetera. And the resistance to change is he makes the whole thing about resistance to change in what the organism and the death drive right mm -hmm. it, it, yep. it kind of it's kind of stubborn in trying to go back to the inorganic or whatever but uh yeah. that's its own thing in, <laughs> in any case Gil thanks again I'm glad that you came on the show and talked to us about this I think it's going to give us a lot of structure going into Deleuze's book on Hume which I think too will make his, his book on Kant more enjoyable. And I, and I do think that, you know, sometimes the monographs aren't mined as deeply. I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of attention given to some of the books we mentioned, A Thousand Plateaus, Antiochus, yeah. obviously Difference Repetition Logic of Sense. Some of these other works sometimes fall by the wayside and including empiricism and subjectivity, it would be kind of interesting to go back, look at the Hume, look at the Kant. I know that Liz's comp book is, is short, but kind of like his Leibniz book, it's really dense. Super and dense. It, it does require a little bit of, of prep. So I'm, I'm glad that we got to do that today. Well, let me flag up for you as you approach that book yeah. that like one of the coolest, I think, innovations of Deleuze's reading of Kant, which I don't think is either explicitly in the texts of Kant's or in, I don't think I've ever seen anyone else make the case, but there's something really convincing about Deleuze's argument that in each of the critiques, what we see is like the discovery of a higher faculty or a yeah. higher function for yeah. each of the faculties and then the subordination of the other faculties to each of them in turn mm -hmm. as they sort of achieve their higher function. It's a really innovative reading and it's a really generative way of, of approaching Kant's work. This is essential to deficit repetition and yes. this sort of this higher function so that's a good point to bring out i think it's what in particular pure reason it's actually the understanding that's supposed yes. to like dominate practical reason it's reason or uh, and then in what is it the imagination desire. and or desire in the oh right okay because we, we talked about that i'm glad we did but in the I think it's the imagination in the third too. Yeah, yeah right so and it's the third that he as you brought up he finds a lot of fruit and he that's where he develops the the discordant accord of the faculties yes, and yep. all of that. And that's going to be something I'll, I'll want to talk about. And I think he even introduces it in the Kant book, but he he develops it more in different repetition. That's good shit. And again, thanks for coming on. Thanks for for hanging out. Yeah, boys. And you know what? I have one last thing to plug, if that's all yeah, right. Please. Um, I recently appeared as a guest on the Being an Event 
podcast uh, oh, wow. hosted by Alex Galloway and Andrew Culp, along with uh, Dave Maritzella, one of my collaborators and translator, co-translators. And we had like a really fun discussion about the specifically about like the Spinoza, the Spinoza entry from being an event by Baggio. So that was available wherever you get your podcasts. Check it out. It was a great time. And the, the whole project that they're doing over there is really cool. So, yeah. Hell yeah. No, that's, that's good. Uh, it's, I haven't read being an event in probably like 10, 12 years. So that that's something I, I, I've i mentioned to Coop that we would want to do, but yeah. you know, we would want to be do. All right, fellas, I'm going to out. All right, thanks, um, everybody. Thank you. Let's... Have a great, have a great day. You too, guys. Bye bye. Once again, thanks to Gil Morejon for joining Taylor and I on this week's edition of the Machinic Unconscious Happy Hour. The very roots of eating, of negativity and singularity. Including the ultimate form of security, which is unconscious. The whole state of things, a cure of violence without object anymore. This is the typical violence of information. It's violent because what happens there is a murder of the real vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. What I meant is the following. With nothing left but recycled, whitewashed, Lobotomized people, as in a block work orange.